Everybody and welcome to another video of Prehistoric Planet 2 where we will be covering oceans. So this is the fourth episode of the series and yeah let's get into it. So um, I personally enjoyed Oceans Thoroughly which is the second last episode of the show featuring several marine animals of the late Maastrichtian but um, let's dive into it shall we. Oh, damn it I made a pun again. Um, so we begin with a large mosasaur swimming over a reef due to the difference in coloration. I'd like to assume it's either Prognathodon or Hainosaurus, as the Mosasaurus Hoffmani seen later has several different colours. Though this could just be a female, but um, we don't know for sure. Um, but hiding in this coral reef is a much smaller species of mosasaur, also from the seas of the Atlantic and Pacific. So this is Phosphorosaurus, a much smaller mosasaur in the Halosaurine subgroup, which includes species such as Pluridens, Eonotator, and Halosaurus itself. So this female used the reef as a safe place during the day, coming up to the surface every hour or so to take a breath of air. And she does so not to stay out in the open for too long, as the far larger mosasaurs are always on patrol. So to hunt and feed, she must wait until the sun dims and night begins. Her large eyes provide her with better vision than those of the large marine reptiles that she shares the ocean with, and her smaller size also makes her more agile allowing her to hunt small, fast-moving prey, such as the bioluminescent lanternfish that rise from the depths into the shallows at night. And these are shown in the episode to, to um, use their bioluminescence to um, stun attackers with a flash, and also create a form of camouflage by blending their glowing underside with the moonlit surface. So, these fish may be quick, but they do not fool Phosphorosaurus with their bioluminescence, and she enjoys a glowing nocturnal fish feast. And after a successful night of hunting, she has to retreat back to the shelter of the reef, as the larger mosasaurs are back on patrol as the day begins. Moving on to the shallow seas of, off the coast of the West Interior Seaway of North America, where large shoals of fish are beginning to gather, and peculiar predators are beginning to feast. So this introduces us to Hesperornis, a six foot long seabird which lacks wings as they do not require them, and using their large specialized feet they can propel themselves through the water with relative ease, feeding freely on this shoal of bait fish. Using a long slender beak filled with sharp needle like teeth, Catching their prey is moderately easy. But the curious Hesperornis are not left alone to eat them for long, as from the gloom emerges the Factinus, or the X fish, a large predatory species of bony fish that is estimated to reach 5 to 6 meters in length. And this is a species I've wanted to see in a documentary since Chased by Sea Monsters. I mean, I think some documentaries may have included it before, I just haven't seen them. But Prehistoric Plant was certainly the one to do it for me, as um, the easy pack and this looked absolutely fantastic with the dark bands going along their backs, and them just looking like an absolute beast. So their large fins cut through the surface as they swim towards the unsuspecting shoal and Hesperornis. They use their large toothy jaws that can swallow several fish at a time, but can also swallow prey half their size, which leads to the Zephactinus having very different ideas. As the bait ball begins to shrink, the Zephactinus turn to the smaller Hesperornis as an alternative. Capable of catching, uh, catching? catching and swallowing them in one gulp. Yeah, this, this shot just reminds me of Chased by Sea Monsters when Nigel Marvin was using these um, different kind of binoculars, I can't remember what they, they're actually called professionally. Uh, I think it was stethoscope, yeah. Yeah, it was, it, it was something. 
uh no not stethoscope uh it it was some form of um wait maybe it might be periscope that that might have been what he said but um he looked down into the water and saw the zephactinus that had the hesperonus in its mouth and swallowed it down in one go this is just what that reminded me of here and um um, yeah, the Zephactus may be faster than the small Hesperonis, but the bird is much more agile than its larger attacker. And though many Hesperonis are eaten, some do manage to escape. Um, there have been famous Zephactinus fossils that have pre preserved full-grown Zephactinus, having swallowed a smaller bony fish called Gillicus, which remained preserved in their stomachs and may have been a cause of death, but... Um, Oh no, nature is tricky sometimes, but um, this awesome fish is, yeah, it looks so much better up close, like look at this thing, it is absolutely magnificent. And with that, the Zephactinus is also shown to favour the taste of their own kind. And so from North America we head over to the shores of Southern Europe, potentially France, but we'll get into that later. Um, where thousands of ammonite eggs are washing into the intertidal zones along the shore. So many begin to hatch, and soon there are thousands, if not millions, of tiny ammonites in their junior shells. But as the tide retreats, the ammonites are at risk of being stranded. So they drift together and form a moving mass to push them deeper into the water of deeper pools. Yeah, that, I, I don't know what I was saying there. But this allows them to get closer to the waves and manage to reach deeper water successfully. And ride the high tide, and that allows them to reach the open sea, taking thousands out. But um, nature has to be fair sometimes. Though many survive, thousands also perish on the low tide. Providing food for a surprising addition to the show in the form of baby pyroraptors, a species from southern France that was discovered after a forest fire, hence the name. But these youngsters may be all we see of this species of dromaeosaur, which was featured in Jurassic World Dominion, um, for those who don't know. But um, I originally thought this was in Season 1, so pyroraptor was in Season 1, as in the teaser for forests, um, the atrociraptor looked a lot redder and... Since it looked like it was in a forest fire setting, I thought they were going to do like a Pyroraptor origin story. But um, yeah, I'm glad that we've actually got Pyroraptor in the show now, though it is just a baby at this point. So we head towards the center of the Pacific for our reintroduction to Tyrannosaurus. And um, they are taking refuge in shallow atolls as they are not hunting currently. But um, this leads me to assume we are in the waters towards New Zealand, as Tyrannosaurus is really only known from there. So the Tyrannosaurus then must feed and have to enter deeper water to find shoals of fish to feed on. And this is where large predators that feed upon them wait for their chance to strike. Taking the form of the returning Mosasaurus, by far the most famous of its kind, and despite what you might first think, there are specimens of different species in the Mosasaurus clade, with one of them being found around New Zealand, specifically Mosasaurus mokoroa, not Ho Mosasaurus hoffmani, although that may be what the show is intending, but there is at least a Mosasaurus around New Zealand, and this could very well be changed out for that. Um, so while the Tyrannosaurus hunt, um, I did previously assume these were Zarapasaura, um, as I originally thought we were in Morocco or somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean where Mosasaurus Hofmani would have made more sense and Zarafasaurus would have been good, but I'm glad we see the return of Tyrannosaurus nonetheless. So using their agility and skill to hunt in the thick of the fish shoal, um, they are unaware that they in fact are the ones being hunted. And the Mosasaurus hides beneath them along the sea floor, preparing to strike. So it curves into a C shape, it 
and then it accelerates with great speed moving faster than I have ever thought of a Mosasaur being able to move but there is more on that later so the Mosasaurus continues to swim after the unsuspecting Tarangisaurus but um, yeah it manages to keep pace which is fairly impressive but unfortunately for this Mosasaurus and for many predators in nature this hunt out of 10 is likely to fail as this one unfortunately does for the predator but another chance to hunt and prevent pre prevents itself no presents itself it doesn't want to prevent that's not <laughs> that's not good for the show um and the mosasaurus prepares its attack waiting for an inexperienced juvenile to make a mistake and then, like a great white shark, it breaches from the water with young Tarangisaurus in jaws. As well as the bite, the force of the impact killed this young Elasmosaur instantly, as with the speed of a semi-truck coming at it, it, it was all done in an instant. And the Mosasaurus then claims its meal. We then return to the waters off Europe to the Ammonites that have slowly grown larger. And on these seagrass meadows in the Mediterranean, we find several more, more species of Ammonites that share the space of these juveniles, many taking several different shapes and in different sizes, such as the large Bacchylites, which feeds around the sea floor. I'm actually familiar with Bacchylites as it was featured in Jurassic World the game. And, um, yeah, I was happy to see this species included. Um, as well as Diplomoceros, a large ammonite species, um, which had a long shot going for it. Um, so these are one of the largest species, and, yeah, they are shaped like a giant paperclip. Can't sugarcoat that any better than that. So, um, yeah, I'm probably just going to call this the paperclip ammonite. As that's a fun and that's a more fun name. Um, as well as the returning scaphitid ammonites from season one, with here they seem to be using coloration of a nautilus. So the hatchling's distinct spiral identifies them as nostoceros, with the adults being even more peculiar, with the adults seeming to have their beaks towards their own shells. Don't know what kind of evolutionary achievement that is eat yourself <laughs> but um yeah ammonites were around long enough to experiment and these particular nostoceros like to feed in the deep water on the edge of the meadows and with 400 million years of evolution the ammonites have been able to diversify into this variety of different species taking many different sizes and shapes Surviving all the way up until the end of the Maastrichtian, which ended with the famous asteroid hitting the Earth. But this was not just the ending of the evolutionary legacies of the dinosaurs, pterosaurs and giant marine reptiles that the Mesozoic had been ruled by, but also the even greater legacy of the Ammonites, which were even able to survive up to the frozen poles. And with that segue, we head down to the final destination, Antarctica. Where dwelling in the newly opened holes in the sea ice due to summer melt, we find Mortineria, a species of large plesiosaur from the frozen continent, with most fossils being present around Seymour Island, around the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. So this part of Mortineria have travelled to the frozen oceans of the Antarctic from South America, as Sir David states in the episode. And, um to give their calves experience swimming around sea ice and better their skills as a hunter. So the calves must stick close to their mothers in order to not become lost and unable to find breathing holes which is important for air breathing reptiles. So the Morton area then dive to, f to find food. Which surprisingly is not fish but small animals living in the seabed. And using their bizarre jaws and thin teeth, they exercise a sieving technique to filter out the sediment and consume the small animals within. 
and after a successful hunt, that they return to the surface, ending the episode and showing that the most resourceful animals find opportunities in the oceans of the prehistoric planet. And like the previous three episodes, um, the episode actually ends with Prehistoric Planet Uncovered, where with the help of Dr. Michael Habib, or is it Habib, and Kirsten Formoso of the University of Southern California, um, we go through the science behind understanding the speed of the Mosasaurs. And analyzing in an experiment performed by the prehistoric plant team, they found the Mosasaurus may have used a sea movement that fish use to accelerate, which allowed them to move quickly in short periods of time. And the team also found that Mosasaurus Hoffmani was potentially capable of moving at 30 miles per hour in a second. Yeah, that's that's fast for, for a large animal like that, but that is not uncommon of the largest animals today. Whales can move surprisingly fast when they need to. And orca, the largest of the dolphins, are sometimes called the fastest animals in the ocean. So it doesn't really matter the size too much. But um, yeah, that was, was oceans. So did you like it, not like it, or are you mixed? Any, Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing this every night, all right. So, anyway, tomorrow is North America, the finale of season two, the most anticipated biome of the series. <laughs> um, so are you excited or not really? Let me know in the comments below. So, like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe for more, as we have recently passed 400 subscribers, and I cannot thank you enough for that. You guys are really great, and I would really appreciate it if we could keep that number growing. And, um, yeah, I'm not going to set any goals right now. I'll just let it grow. So, let's stay excited for tomorrow's video with the finale of Prehistoric Planet 2. And I will see you then. Bye.